If someone were to ask you, what is the defining characteristic or the mark of a fully devoted follower of Jesus, what would you say? What's the key attribute? What's the distinguishing mark of a disciple of Christ? Now, to help you think clearly about what I mean by distinguishing mark, um, it's the bottom line. It's the litmus test. It's the end goal of any endeavor. For instance, what's the distinguishing mark of a really good restaurant? Well, it's got to be delicious food. You, you could have great parking. You could have great service. You could have cleanliness. You could have a great atmosphere. But if the food isn't good, you're not a good restaurant. What's the distinguishing mark of a great sports team? It's cool uniforms, right? No, no, it's championships. You can have the best arena. You can have the, the best branding. You can have the best mascot. You can have all the MVPs money can buy, but if there's no rings on the finger, you're not great as a team. What's the distinguishing mark of a business? Well, it's the income statement, isn't it? More than the brand, more than sales growth, more than market share is the company making a profit. So now apply this distinguishing mark thinking back to the question, to the faith, to following Jesus. What's the mark? What's the distinguishing attribute? What's the litmus test of being a healthy and being an effective follower of Christ, his disciple? Well, Jesus was actually asked this question. Someone came to him and said, Lord, of all the commandments, of all the actions in the faith, what's the number one? What's the most important mark? And Jesus said, it's love. It's love. It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Followers of Christ express love. That's our mark. We love God. That's our faith and our belief. And that flows into loving others. So in the end, loving others is the distinguishing mark of the authentic believer. It's the litmus test. Not knowledge, not works, not doctrinal understanding, not church membership, not pious behaviors, but how we love others. I want you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Hebrews. Today we'll be in Hebrews chapter 13. In fact, we're looking at our last passage of our summer study. And guess what today's passage is going to challenge us to do? To love others. To pursue that distinguishing mark of a follower of Jesus. Now this book, it's been a great study. It's been really heady and it's been really practical. It's emphasized the superiority of Jesus to all things and it's called upon us to endure in the faith. And over the last three or four weeks, we've seen the study move from doctrine to practice. The first 10 chapters of Hebrews, it's very doctrinal. It's very focused on Christology. But the last three chapters are focused on practice. It's moved from creed to conduct. And we're going to see that especially in today's passage. In fact, today's passage is going to give you and me a laundry list of things to do. In fact, for you type A people, I have a gift for you today. At the end of my sermon, I'm going to give you a to-do list for this week. And here will be the bottom line for today. God's people love people. Persevering in the faith means that we continually express love for others. Followers of Jesus live in love. In Christ, we freely give what we have freely received from the Father. It's just that simple. God's people love people. Our love for God, our devotion to him, should produce in us an attitude of love towards other people. So let's take a look at the passage. And as you look at chapter 13, verse one, you'll see the theme clearly emerge. It says, keep on what? Loving one another as brothers and sisters. It's right there. God's people love people. This is what we do. This is the fruit of our faith. It's our authenticating mark. And the passage tells us who to love. It tells us 
how to love and when to love. Who should we love? Well, it says keep on loving one another. So who would that include? Everybody. We should love people. Well, how should we love? Like family. We should love people like one of our own, like our own brother or sister. When should we love? Continually, unending. It says keep on loving one another. You know, Jesus spoke of this distinguishing mark, John chapter 13, verse 35. He said, it is by this that you, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you what? You love one another. Romans chapter 12, the apostle Paul, he lists loving devotion as a primary expression of the faithful believer. He says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. God's People love people. So what does it mean to love someone? Well, love is an attitude. It's a a disposition towards someone that causes you to choose or to commit to nurturing them and protecting them. Nurturing them, being a positive influence in their life that benefits them. Protecting them, keeping them from harm. Love is not merely a feeling as much as it is a commitment that flows from that attitude or that disposition or that affection towards someone. And the scriptures are clear. We're commanded to love. We're commanded to love people in the church and we're commanded to love people outside of the church. We are to love all of God's children, all of those created by him and for him, each one who bears his image The Imago Dei, each one is worthy of love and has dignity. Each one is someone that Christ died for and is valuable in the sight of God and therefore to us. So a few thoughts on love. You can love someone who's different than you. You can love someone even though there's been hurt or conflict between you. You can love someone that you don't understand You can even love someone that you disagree with. Did you know that? Did you know that you can love someone who thinks differently than you or has different opinions than you? It's true. You can love both Republicans and Democrats. You can love someone who's wealthy or someone who's in need. You can love someone who's young and hip or someone who needs a hip replacement. You can love someone from a rival team or a rival school or a business competitor. You can love someone who is a citizen or someone who is an immigrant. You can love someone from a different race, a different gender, a different religion, someone with different views than you on sexuality or morality or or has different opinions on border control or mask requirements. You can even love people who talk too much about Bitcoin or listen to Luke Bryan or put ketchup on their steak. By the way, same crowd on all three of those things. <laughs> God's people, what? Love people. We express the love of the creator for those he created in his image, regardless of color or cause or creed. So let's start with a gut check this morning. Do you have a group of people or a person that you actually despise because they're different than you? Do you have a person or a people group that you actually hate or have prejudice towards, that you harbor malice towards them? I want you to imagine you're driving into your neighborhood and you see on the front porch of a home you're gonna drive by a flag Is there a flag that they could fly that would actually cause you to wish misfortune upon them? What about a Confederate flag? Or a rainbow flag? Or a Black Lives Matter flag? Or a Don't Tread on Me flag? You see, if you harbor malice towards someone who bears the image of God, you dishonor God. And the passage says God's people do what? Love people. 
Well, what the passage is going to do is it's going to give us four categories of people to love and one thing not to love. And here's our list. Strangers, prisoners, spouses, not money, and spiritual leaders. Let's move to verse 2. Loving strangers. It says, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. God's people love people, even people they don't know, people you meet, people passing through, people that have a brief intersection in your life, people in need. We show them hospitality. Hospitality is the act of receiving someone with warmth and care. Now, in context, The Hebrew Christians who received this letter in the first century were a a group of Christians under intense pressure and, and persecution. And perhaps that persecution eliminated access to certain services or necessity. And the writer is encouraging this group of believers to take care of people in need, even if they were strangers. Show hospitality to them. People in need of a meal, people in need of a drink, people in need of a bed. And the writer enriches his call to hospitality by dangling a mystical carrot in front of them. He says, hey, you may take in a stranger who ends up being an angel. And there's actually biblical precedent for this. Genesis chapter 18, Abraham brought three strangers into his home and they ended up being angels. Samson's mother in Judges 13 entertained a stranger who ended up being an angel. Now, the passage is not encouraging you to seek or speculate about angelic visitors, but just know it's happened, so who knows? Here's what I do know for certain. We could use a little more biblical hospitality in our society right now. Jesus often used hospitality in his ministry. He ministered to people at the table, He ate with sinners and saints. He went to dinner parties and and weddings. The scriptures say that the Son of Man came eating and drinking. Well, why is that? Well, there's just something special that happens when we gather around the table or in the living room. Hospitality sets the atmosphere for soup things to become spiritual things, where caring and comfort can lead to hope and peace. When we serve others through the the act of biblical hospitality, they're able to actually feel God's touch. He becomes tangible to them. He becomes palatable to them. He becomes measurable and real to them. Rosaria Butterfield said this about hospitality. Hospitality is ground zero for Christian ministry. It's where strangers become neighbors and neighbors become the family of God. And you see the call to hospitality throughout the New Testament. 1 Peter 4, 9 says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Have people over and don't complain about it. Romans 12, 13 says, share with the Lord's people in need, practice hospitality. When we open the doors of our homes and the doors of our hearts to friends and strangers, we're loving well. And God's people love people. So do you practice hospitality? Do you have an open door policy? Do you view your home more as a museum or a mission field? And can you think of someone that you might need to extend an invitation to this week? Be ready. A stranger may come across your path. And that's not very hard to find in Northwest Arkansas, is it? Strangers move here every day from around the country and around the world. Look across your your street. If there's a Big Ten flag in the window, that's a stranger. Invite them over. Pray for them. Look at verse three. Our list of people to love is growing. It says, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you, you yourselves were suffering. These words reminded these Hebrews, these first century Christians, to continue to love those who were being persecuted and who were being mistreated because of the faith. And we already know from Hebrews chapter 10 
that many who were on the receiving end of this letter had been mistreated or been in prison. In fact, look at these two verses from chapter 10. It says, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insults and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. These first century believers had experienced suffering. And they had cared for their fellow believers who were in the midst of the fire. Just stop and think about the gravity of that situation. You know, throughout church history, there has been a high cost for following Jesus for many. And this is true of many in our world currently, that their faith in Jesus, their associating them, their name with his name has brought suffering into their lives and they've paid a price for being a part of the church. Would you do that? If being a Jesus follower actually costs you something, would you still come to church? Would you still associate yourself with Christ? If it costs you pain or suffering or puts you at risk physically or politically or legally, would you endure? The writer is encouraging these Christians to keep loving their persecuted friends well. He says, continue to remember those in prison and do so with empathy as if it were happening to you. Love them as if you were them. Put yourself in their shoes. Experience their hurts and their pains as though they were your own. Pray for them, serve them, care for them as if you were in prison with them. One of the things that we can do today to minister to the persecuted church is to cover them in prayer and to give to that cause. And I'll give you a quick resource. There's a ministry called Voice of the Martyrs. Their website is really easy to remember, persecution.com. And on that website, you can find prayer guides and real stories of real people in real prisons because of their faith. And I encourage you to cover them in prayer and make it a habit. Well, God's people love people. We love one another. We love strangers. We love prisoners. And next, it goes into the home. Look at verse four. It says, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. God's people love people. And that doesn't just mean people in the church or in the community, but in our homes as well. And here it says, marriage is to be held in high honor. It is to be cherished. It is to be fought for. It doesn't downgrade the dignity of singleness. There are passages that honor being single as well. But here, it calls us to a high view of marriage. God's ordained cornerstone of the family. Marriage is to be considered precious. We are to celebrate it and honor it and defend the sanctity of this relationship. Marriage was created by God and it is defined by God. It's not subject to revision. It cannot be taken hostage or downgraded in importance. It is a sacred and holy institution. And fellowship is a church that wants to fight for healthy marriages. And we've invested heavily in our marriage ministries, our merge ministry, which exists for those who are seriously dating or who are engaged. Our re-engage ministry, which exists to, to help us have some enrichment in our marriage, regardless of what stage or year you're in. And then our counseling center, which is there to offer some more expertise help when needed. We want to help you have a healthy marriage. And I want to challenge you to invest in your marriage Read a book on marriage this year. Take a class on marriage this year. Go to a conference on marriage this year. This relationship is so important and deserves our focus and our intentionality. But look at the second half of the verse. It gives a specific application for honoring marriage, healthy and pure sexuality. The marriage bed or the sexual relationship should be pure undefiled, not adulterous, not sexually immoral. You know, God created sex and he wants us to enjoy it and for it to be practiced in a healthy way. And healthy sexuality has a proper 
context, marriage. Sex is to be expressed between a man and a woman in the context of a heterosexual monogamous relationship for life. And the passage gives us a warning that the sexual immorality and the adulterer will be judged by God. Well, what is considered sexually immoral? Well, we have to define it in 2021. It would be sexual practice outside of the proper context. So premarital sex, extramarital sex, homosexual sex, pornographic sex. And I know that in today's culture, we rarely find God's standard taught or affirmed, but it doesn't make it any less true. And our calling as followers of Jesus is to keep the marriage bed pure. So as a church, we can't legitimize, we can't validate sex outside of the biblical context. Instead, our job is to, to call us to a higher holy standard and then help people live that out. So if you're here today and you are outside of God's will sexually, I want, I want you to hear me very clearly. We love you. We love you. And we're here to help. We wouldn't be helping you by pushing you down that road, we want to point you towards God's best. Amen? So love one another. Love strangers. Love prisoners. Love spouses. And look at verse 5. It gives us something not to love. Money. Just when you thought this sermon couldn't get any more intense. Keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have because God said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. God's people love people, but they don't love money. Followers of Christ are not consumed with materialism. We know and understand that contentment is not found in things. It's found in him. Him, the one who will never leave us, the one who is our helper. The scriptures warn again and again against making money and possessions into idols. It says again and again that the threats of materialism and grief and, and discontentment are dangerous for the Christ follower. You can't read the scriptures without hearing the message. Don't trust in riches. You can't find peace in material things. Don't let your possessions possess you. Jesus said, what good is it if you were to gain the whole world yet forfeit your own soul. And the passage gives a recommendation, a recommendation for contentment. It says, be grateful. Be thankful for what you have. And I'll add to that a weapon to fight against greed and materialism, generosity, which would give me a great challenge for us this week. Practice those two Gs. Be grateful. Take inventory of what you have and be content and be generous. Give something away. Give it to the Lord Give it to someone in need. Be generous. Lastly, look at verse seven. It challenges us to love our leaders. It says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The call is to remember your spiritual leaders. Remember the godly wisdom they spoke to you, the godly lifestyle they modeled for you. Recall what they mean to you. Revisit their example. Aren't you thankful for the godly men and women that the Lord brought into your life along your journey to point you upwards? I know that I am. I can't imagine who I would be in this world had the Lord not sent godly spiritual leaders into my life. I want to challenge you this week to remember them. Send them a text. Send them a, a note. Give them a call. And I'm not asking for gift cards for me. I'm talking about your spiritual leaders, your community group leaders, your college leaders that came alongside of you. Just say, hey, I was thinking about you, and I want you to know that what you did made a difference. And the things that they did right that brought glory to the Lord, imitate them. Where you saw them faithful, reproduce that faithfulness in your life. And look at verse 8. Never forget the one who's always faithful. 
the ultimate leader, Jesus Christ, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I want to add verse 17. The writer returns to this concept of leadership at the end of the chapter. He says, have confidence in your leaders. Submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as ones who must give account, an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden. For that would be of no benefit to you. Don't just remember them. Follow them. Submit to them. God installed them in your life to lead you. You know, being a good follower is a lost art in our day and time. We live in a world where submission is considered weakness and authority has been rendered a matter of opinion. So these are great verses to challenge us in the church. Part of being a follower of Christ is submitting to godly leadership. Part of being in the church is following church leadership. And I don't know about you, but I think this was put to the test last year. We're an elder-led church. This isn't my church. This isn't Mickey's church. This isn't Mark Schatzman's church. Whose church is it? It's Jesus' church. And the Lord has given us this model of leadership, a godly group of elders to guide us. And they had to make a lot of tough calls last year and may have to do so again this fall. And I don't know about you, but you may not have agreed with all of those calls. But that's not what the passage is about. It's not about agreeing with your leaders. It's about what? Following well. So many of us were challenged here, and these verses are a great reminder. Did our fellowship of our leaders lead to joy, or did we become a burden? God's people, what? Love people. It's our distinguishing mark. It's the litmus test of the authenticity and the veracity of our faith. Well, I made a promise to you. I promised that I would send you home with a to-do list. So for all type A people, ta-da, you're welcome. I wanna give you some things to do this week. Maybe pick your top two. If you're an overachiever, go for it. First one, gut check. Is there hate in your heart? For a person or a people group. The passage is real clear. Keep on loving people. Secondly, do you need to open your door and invite someone to experience love through hospitality? Look across the street. That house has probably sold three times in the last 12 months. People are moving here all the time. And by the way, if you just moved here, Walk across the hall right after this. We have a newcomer social. We'd love to get to know you and show you some hospitality. We have some high-end snacks today. (laughs) Three, pray for those who don't live in a country that lets them come to a place like this and sing songs and hear from the Bible. Persecution.com. Cover those who are suffering for the faith with prayer. Invest in your marriage. Take a class. Read a book. Go to a conference. Or maybe take that final step to go to counseling. I've been, and probably your neighbor has. There's no shame in it. Get some expertise, help. Be content, the two Gs. Take a gratefulness inventory and give something away this week. And then lastly, why don't you thank one of your spiritual leaders? Remind them that their investment in you is there. Take a picture of it or download the slides from the website. And let's put our faith in action this week. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, what a challenging passage. Um, I pray that as we bring Hebrews to a close this week, that we could start to put our faith in action. Lord, I pray that we, Fellowship Bible Church, Fellowship Rogers, would be known for our love. Lord, that we would be people who have open arms to express who you are to those who live here, and those who are moving here. Father God, I pray that you would guide each one of us through your Holy Spirit as we hear these words today and that you would convict our hearts in just the right place to help us take a step closer to you and in our spiritual maturity. We'll give you all the glory and all the credits. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.